Even though it may seem like dinosaurs were the only living things on land for the entire Mesozoic era, they were actually not alone. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the other land animals that were around during the dinosaur's reign. Now, I already have videos talking about Cretaceous life, which the Cretaceous was the last period in the Mesozoic era. So in this video, I'm going to be focusing on the Triassic and the Jurassic periods, which went from around 252 million years ago to around 145 million years ago combined. Now, the key events that happened during these two periods were the recovery of devastated animals after the Great Dying, or the end Permian mass extinction, the largest extinction event of all time. And then we had repeated extinction events after the Great dying in the early Triassic period, which I talk about in my early Mesozoic ocean life video that I'll link up here to the top right if you want to check it out. And then we also had marine predators, aka marine reptiles, come on the scene that looked a lot like sea monsters. We had huge crocodiles, like on the thumbnail up for this video, and we had tropical land plants evolve that aided the evolution of the very first mammals and dinosaurs in the Triassic. So dinosaurs evolved in the Triassic period, Period, the first period in the Mesozoic, as did mammals. So we'll talk a lot about mammals as well as dinosaurs today. And then we had a mass extinction in the Triassic period in between the Triassic-Jurassic boundary as well. But again, today's video is all about the land plants and animals or land life during these two periods. I have a whole nother video talking about marine life during those two periods and a whole nother video about the late Triassic extinction. So first we'll start with vegetation and we'll move our way to animals because the vegetation really laid the groundwork for animal evolution on land during this time interval. Unlike the changing landscape of the Paleozoic era before the Mesozoic era, the land of the Mesozoic was completely covered in vegetation. Now, if you remember from my videos about the Paleozoic era, there was no vegetation in the beginning. Then you had, you know, your bacteria and algae and fungi and mosses move to land. And then finally, larger seed plants and trees and forests and stuff later on. But that was a long process to get to that, whereas the Mesozoic era starts off fully vegetated with relatively familiar types of plants and types of trees in the forest, and we'll talk about those in a couple slides. But before we do, I want to explain that the plants were very important during not only the evolution of land animals to begin with in the late Paleozoic, like I talk about in my Carboniferous videos, but also for the evolution of the first mammals and dinosaurs. Herbivores of both of these groups needed plants as a food source, obviously, and carnivores needed the herbivores. Like I talk about in the early Mesozoic marine life video, plant life also had a very slow time recovering after the Great Dying. This was because there were three successive extinction events just after the major Great Dying extinction event that were due to spikes in global warming, and I talk about how we know that and why that was in that video. But in any case, the early Triassic was dominated by lycopods. We had low diversity because as things were still recovering and there had just been a major extinction, so lycopods were pretty much the thing. Then, however, in the Middle Triassic, ferns took over, and we can see fossilized ferns and lycopods both in this picture down to the bottom right. However, eventually as plant life continued to recover and spread throughout the Triassic period, the trees that stood over these ferns belong to three groups of gymnosperms. Recall from my Cretaceous videos that angiosperms, or flowering plants, hadn't evolved yet. And so gymnosperms, things like pine trees, other conifers, stuff like that, they pretty much represented all the land trees. And other than the fact that there were no flowers yet, it would have looked somewhat similar to today. It's just the missing flowers. The three groups of gymnosperms that represented the trees of this time included the cycads and cycadioids. Cycads are tropical trees superficially resembling palms, uh, but they're rare today. And cycadioids were similar to them, but they are now extinct. The second group, which I think we are most familiar with on modern Earth, uh, were conifers. And with the exception of the pine family, all modern families of conifers had evolved by then and were present in the early Mesozoic. The third group, which is represented by only one species, one living species today on modern Earth, were the ginkgos. 
the one living species of ginkgo actually looks a lot like the fossil leaves from the early Mesozoic, indicating just how much of a living fossil the living ginkgo is and just how little that it's changed through evolution from the early Mesozoic to now. So, you know, whatever it's doing must be working. But now that we know what type of vegetation and what types of trees were around, let's talk a little bit about what animals we're eating them. So we'll start with the first mammals. The great dying devastated therapsids, which were a group of organisms that evolved from the amniotes that I talk about in my Carboniferous videos. But these therapsids left behind an important legacy. Mammals. The first mammals evolved in the late Triassic from the few therapsid survivors. Now, I should clarify that therapsids did re-diversify quite greatly in the Triassic, and so by the late Triassic, there was more than a few survivors. Um, it was only a few at the beginning of the Triassic, then they re-diversified, and then they completely dwindled after the late Triassic extinctions, but that's for a later slide. Dinosaurs, however, kept these early mammals very small all the way through the Mesozoic era, the entire time that dinosaurs dominated the terrestrial realm of Earth, the mammals were unable to become larger, become more diverse, and radiate, and dominate, because the dinosaurs were already doing that. This advantage of the dinosaurs over the mammals actually began literally just because they evolved slightly earlier than the mammals. So you can imagine that things might have been completely different had the timing of these different evolutionary events been slightly different or completely switched. Now, of course, my thumbnail says it wasn't as dinosaurs. I'm talking about all life that was around during the Triassic Jurassic, but you have to admit it is the age of dinosaurs. So I have to talk a little bit about them. So dinosaurs are formally known as dinosauria or what we refer to as dinosaurs is basically that clade of organisms. And these are members of Dinosauromorpha. So early dinosauromorphs evolved in the early Triassic, and many spent most time on all fours, but some were adapted to rise up and walk on two legs. And something that contributed to their success was their legs that extended straight down instead of slightly going out to the side and then down like in the therapsids. This helped them run faster, and this trait was passed down to the dinosaurs, which then contributed to their success. Many Triassic dinosaurs, however, remained relatively small. It wasn't until the Jurassic period that they became pretty much huge. And even then, there were still plenty of small dinosaurs. I think that's one of the misconceptions, is that they were all huge. They were very diverse. They were small, they were medium, they were large, they were everything in between. But only a few got to huge sizes in the Triassic. For example, the Melanorosaurus. Oh my god, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> uh, that became quite huge in the Triassic, up to 40 feet or 12 meters. But again, as you all know, they became much larger in later periods of the Mesozoic. Crocodiles also evolved from early dinosauromorphs. Again, dinosauromorphs are the larger clade that includes dinosauria, which is what we refer to as dinosaurs, but it also includes other branches that branched off to other organisms like crocodiles. So dinosauromorph does not equal dinosaur, even though it has that in the first part of its name. Just want to clarify. And so crocodiles evolved from these, and it wasn't until after the Triassic period that dinosaurs actually rose to much greater prominence. So the crocodiles and other dinosauromorphs at this point were still pretty prominent, and it wasn't until, you know, the Jurassic and Cretaceous that dinosaurs rose above everything. Although, as we know today, the tables have turned because, you know, here's a picture of a crocodile with a dinosaur in its mouth. <laughs> so modern dinosaurs are no match for the crocodiles, but in the past, dinosaurs and the Jurassic and Cretaceous were a little bit more on top. Two major groups of dinosaurs existed, and the two groups are separated based on their pelvic structures. The first were the ornithischians, or the bird-hipped dinosaurs, as we commonly call them just because their hips or pelvic structures resemble that of modern birds, and these were mostly herbivores and mostly walked on all fours, but some were bipedal. The second major type were the cerisians, or the lizard-hipped dinos, and these were both herbivores and carnivores. Some walked or ran on all fours and some on two legs, and some sauropods reached lengths of over 30 meters or 100 feet long. However, I do want to specify here that birds 
yes, birds evolved from dinosaurs, birds are dinosaurs, but birds actually evolved from the lizard-hipped dinosaurs, not the bird-hipped dinosaurs. So it's kind of confusing to remember, but yeah, I find this really funny and also just, you know, a testament to convergent evolution. But yeah, they branched off from a group of Cerisians and, you know, eventually became birds. Now, in terms of dinosaur success and why they were so successful, there are many reasons. But one major reason was their fast metabolism. Just like mammals today or modern dinosaurs, birds, they had really fast metabolisms. And for a while, we actually thought they were ectothermic, not with much evidence to stand on, just basically because we thought they were reptiles and we literally named them dinosaurs, aka terrible lizard in Greek. <laughs> um, and they're not lizards. Now we know that they were likely endothermic or warm-blooded. By the way, ectothermic means cold-blooded, if you didn't know that. Um, so now we have much more evidence that points toward dinosaurs having been endothermic or mostly endothermic. This evidence includes things like them having feathers or feather-like coats for insulation. It also includes the fact that we now can measure their speed and endurance from their trackways. Um, it also includes their bone structures and just the multitude of tubes for blood vessels that they had in their bones, which matches those more so of a modern endotherms than it does ectotherms, aka mammals and birds, rather than things like reptiles, and oxygen isotope ratios from dinosaur bones that represent their body temperatures also point more toward endothermy. But there is some room in that data for some of the species having maybe been ectothermic or only partially endothermic. But I discuss all of these lines of evidence in much more detail, as well as other factors that contributed to their success in a whole separate video that if it's out now, I'll link it up to the top right. It'll also be linked at the end of this video. Um, but I talk about their keys to their success as well as, you know, debunking misconceptions about dinosaurs. Lastly, for this video, because it is about land life and technically the atmosphere is land, as opposed to marine, obviously, um, I want to talk a little bit about the flyers or everything that was taking to the air during the Triassic and Jurassic periods. So in the late Triassic, vertebrates invaded the air for the first time. Recall that flying invertebrates, aka things like insects, had already evolved, but Vertebrates had not evolved to fly yet, and the first of these were the pterosaurs, as shown in these images. The pterosaurs had long wings, hollow bones, and some had long tails as well. And I just want to briefly point out that I said flying vertebrates. I did not say flying dinosaurs. We will talk about flying dinosaurs, aka birds, <laughs> in the next slide. But pterosaurs were not dinosaurs. They share a common ancestor, but they did not evolve from dinosaurs. And the great wing links of pterosaurs suggest that they flapped their wings to take off, but soared once they were in the air, so they didn't need to flap much once in the air. They were also likely able to walk and even climb when not in flight, because they had like claws at the corners of their wings that they could use to climb. But now getting to the flying dinosaurs, or the birds. Birds evolved from small dinosaurs. But for a while, we thought the oldest bird or bird ancestor was Archaeopteryx, as shown in the fossil here and the reconstruction here. And that was mainly due to the feathers found with Archaeopteryx fossils. But now we know that many dinosaurs had feathers, and it doesn't necessarily make them a bird. And we also know that Archaeopteryx was more of a glider than a flyer. So what was the oldest bird? First of all, it's hard to tell, because their constituents, hollow bones and feathers, don't preserve great. But other than the poor fossil record, another thing that makes it difficult to determine the ancestry of birds is convergent evolution. Everything wants to fly. Flying is a beneficial trait to pretty much anything. For predators to see their prey better, for prey to get away from predators, it's just a beneficial trait. So there's a lot of examples of convergent evolution that led to flying. So convergent evolution is just the evolution of the same trait, but in a whole separate lineage and a whole separate time for example, birds evolved to fly, and then later on, mammals 
bats evolved to fly because that was beneficial for them, but that had nothing to do with evolving from birds. They're not related at all. And so that's an example of conversion evolution, and that can make the fossil record hard to interpret sometimes. But we believe that the oldest unquestionable bird evolved around 20 million years after Archaeopteryx. So Archaeopteryx wouldn't be the oldest bird and actually is a species in the early Cretaceous. But from what I've read, we're still not totally nailed down on any one species having been the oldest bird at this point. However, even though we've ruled out Archaeopteryx as the oldest bird, as well as being a direct ancestor to birds at all, we still know that birds likely share a not too distant ancestor with Archaeopteryx. And so they're somewhat closely related, or at least the oldest bird and Archaeopteryx were very closely related. And so even though birds didn't come from them, it wasn't that far off for us to jump to that conclusion. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we did the Triassic period in between the Triassic and Jurassic with a mass extinction, the fourth of the big five mass extinctions of the Phanerozoic Eon. And this extinction devastated marine life, but it completely transformed terrestrial fauna. And like I mentioned, this was largely because Dinosaurs benefited from it. I mean, who benefits from a mass extinction? But anyway, dinosaurs benefited from this event, obviously, because the loss of competition. Because their competitors, Therapsids, were completely devastated from this extinction event, dinosaurs took over pretty much every land niche after that. But I talk about that in the Triassic mass extinction video that I have a whole video about, as well as a whole separate video where I talk about the reasons for dinosaur success, as well as debunk some common dinosaur mis conceptions. Both of these videos will pop up here in just one second, and if you want to go check out the major reference I'm using for this and other videos in the Earth History playlist, it's called Earth Systems History, and this book is linked in the description below, as well as other minor and supporting references. And that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!